This is the world of commercial striped bass fishing, the side of fishing that you don't see in social media and that most people don't like talking about because all the fish that are caught are killed and eventually sold in grocery stores and restaurants. And as gruesome as this looks, it's the first step in the supply chain in getting you your perfect grocery store fish fillets. The reality is, as long as there's people willing to buy fish, there's gonna be commercial fishermen. But this topic is incredibly controversial, not just because it's commercial fishing, but specifically commercial striped bass fishing is a very hot topic if you live on the East Coast. The reason for this is because the striped bass is a very popular game fish. Recreational anglers up and down the East Coast love to catch this fish solely for the purpose of releasing it, myself included. There it is. <laughs> Contrast that with commercial fishermen who catch the fish so they can sell it and make money. But here's where things get hairy. Striped bass populations have fluctuated wildly over the last 50 years. And in 1985, the populations got so low that a moratorium was put in place, meaning it was no longer legal to buy and sell striped bass. And just to give you an idea of how low the numbers were, one New York Times article cited an 87% decrease in commercial catches. Five years later, the moratorium was lifted. And what followed was a golden age of sorts, with incredibly encouraging numbers and some of the best striped bass fishing that people have experienced in their lifetime. However, since then, numbers have once again not been very promising, with some recreational anglers calling for another moratorium. However, is it just as simple as prohibiting commercial fishing once again? With the rise of social media, the amount of recreational anglers has gone up by 7 million since 2015. And new data suggests that the vast majority of striped bass deaths actually come from poor catch and release practices, with commercial fishing only accounting for about 13% of all striper deaths. So could it be that novice anglers are the ones responsible for killing all the striped bass and not commercial fishermen? I don't think anybody needs two treble hooks on a lure. Striped bass eat their eat head first. They're typically getting that belly hook. And that tail hook I've seen kill many fish. You know, people fishing pencil poppers in the canal, you know, SP minnows or things along those lines. I think, you know, it should be a treble on the belly and a single on the tail. I don't think there's any need for a treble on the tail. It's tough because the, the sport is growing. There's more fishermen now than there ever has been, especially since COVID, and the numbers just continue to grow, and that's not going to change. While folks like Cam see the major influx of beginner recreational anglers as a main cause for the striper deaths, Finn Holly, a prominent surf caster and fishing guide, doesn't put too much stock in the report. I really question the data that they're collecting for it. I think that it's not showing the full truth to the fishery, like what's actually happening. It just doesn't seem like there's enough data points to really see exactly what's happening other than like you can tell that the striped bass, the young of the year every year, I mean, you can look at the spawning results and everything like that. I mean, it's way down and not what it should be. And then from my perspective, I, I just don't like to talk about the data because I feel like as well as the catch and release mortality rates and everything like that, like they caught fish and they put it in the pond and then they caught those fish again. What Finn is alluding to is a 1996 study conducted in Salem, Massachusetts, in which about a thousand fish were caught in traps, tagged, and released into a saltwater pond. 50 volunteers from local fishing clubs were then sent to this saltwater pond to catch and release striped bass. After about 50 days, they observed roughly 9% of the fish died post-release. Over 25 years later, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, the main commission responsible for regulating the striped bass is still using this 1996 paper for a benchmark for their estimates. Which brings into question how realistic are these numbers? When I first started surf casting, it was about 2010, 2011. I think that was the very tail end of what many would consider the golden age of striped bass fishing, especially in my area, which was post moratorium fishing. That post moratorium fishing from all the older fishermen that I talked to on Cape Ann was something that is almost uncomprehensible to a lot of the new anglers. You'll have a point or a cove that would fill up with bass, 25 to 50 pound class fish. And that was every single day where like in Nowadays and now in the fall run, I probably had maybe two beads that were in range this whole fall and they all lasted like a couple of minutes. So like you have dramatic differences like that. They should make it either a game fish or they should put a moratorium on it. The second piece of data that many pro moratorium anglers point to and that Finn also alluded to earlier is the YOY or young of the year referring to the newly spawned striped bass less than one year old. Unlike the catch and release mortality data, this data is gathered multiple times a year. Biologists essentially go to various sample sites throughout the Chesapeake Bay where striped bass spawn, and using nets, they round up all of the baby striped bass and they count them. And without getting into the nitty gritty of the statistics, this line is the long-term average, 
And this is how many young were accounted for this year. And things look bad in 2023. My name's Johnny Rigo, and I've been fishing recreationally since I was like seven, pretty much predominantly in Rhode Island. We can only keep one fish a day between 28 and 31 inches. And they preach about like, well, we do that because anything 31 and up is a breeder. We gotta let the breeders go, gotta let the breeders go. Whereas then I go out on Cam's boat and we see at least what, 50, if not more boats doing the same exact thing harvesting hundreds and hundreds of pounds of breeding striped bass right in the cooler. It's hard not to look at that and be like, well, there you go. There's thousands of pounds of breeding striper dead in one night. While the recreational rhetoric on the fishery has largely been doom and gloom, Cam Brulette, a third generation commercial fisherman, has had a very different experience these last several years. I mean, these past three years, I want to say, these recent three years, it's probably the best striped bass fishing I've seen, you know, since I was a kid. You know, I've seen it, it come back in numbers. Oh, man. That's pretty big. That's a very big fish. We go out every weekend from the end of April to early June. We'll catch 50 striped bass a day, anywhere from, you know, 26 inch bass to 40 pounders. Commercial wise, you know, I'm seeing the same thing. I'm seeing a pretty good bounce back in striped bass right now. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's a good fish. carrying on my grandfather's legacy. You know, he got me started. I remember, you know, being eight, it was either eight, nine years old, going on my first striped bass fishing trip. It was middle of the night fishing, and it was the coolest thing. And I remember falling asleep on the ride home and, you know, the boat ride, and it, it was a, it was an awesome time. And those memories I'll, I'll cherish with, with him forever. Sadly, he passed five years ago. So he handed down his permits to me. You know, I was lucky enough to inherit his fluke and sea bass endorsements, which you can't get anymore and, you know, continue straight bass fishing and everything like that. For people like Cam Brulette, who were born and raised in commercial fishing, a moratorium wouldn't just take away his livelihood, it would take away his lifestyle, and maybe even something that ties him to his late grandfather. There's not an instance where I look back and say, you know, I, I'd rather give up fishing or give up landscaping. You know, I don't have kids yet. Someday they'll want to do it. You know, I have, a, I have a little brother, he's 12. I'm trying to get him to do it, but he doesn't want to get up that early with me. You know, sometimes two, three o'clock in the morning. Starts the day before, usually. You got to go to the bait shop, okay? You know, you're going fishing at night with eels, so you got to go get your, get your eels, it's fueling up the boat getting as much sleep as you can. Usually, you know, if you're fishing all night, for instance, sometimes, you know, for me a lot this summer, I was leaving work at three o'clock, going to the bait shop, grabbing my stuff, coming home, hitching up the boat, getting gas and driving to where I was fishing. Fish all night, come in at four o'clock in the morning, come home, sleep and go to work. So there's a lot that goes into it. And you, you know, trying to get as much sleep as possible, then you're up. They're long, 18, 20, 24 hour days sometimes. Grandfather and I always said, you know, it's a grind, just gotta keep at it. But commercial fishermen are facing a problem even within their own ranks. People like Cam Brulette, young guys who depend on commercial fishing for a sizable chunk of their income, they're a dying breed and they're quickly getting pushed out. Cam alluded to this, but you cannot get a sea bass and fluke permit these days from the state. You have to buy them from someone who already has one, and they can be upwards of $20,000. This naturally creates a barrier to entry for commercial sea bass and fluke, but striped bass endorsements? Pay 30 bucks to the state and it can be yours. And as a result, the market is now flooded with tons of people who don't even depend on commercial fishing to make a living. I definitely think they need to, they need to cancel that. I know many people who, you know, have full-time jobs who just go commercial striper fishing because they have a boat and they have nothing else to do and i just don't think that's right i think you know you at very least have to prove that this commercial fishing is a sizable portion of your income and it's something that you rely on you know in order to use that resource because you know there's no need for these people who are in half a million dollar boats and you know own construction companies or are literally doctors you know there's no need for them to rely on commercial fishing the reason why this is such a problem is because contrary to popular belief the commercial striped bass fishing at least for rod and reel is pretty regulated essentially the way it works is every year a quota is set 
a quota, you can think of it like a fish pool. Every fish that's caught and sold gets tagged and contributes to this pool. Once that pool is full, all fishing for striped bass stops. Literally nobody will buy your fish if you try to sell it to them once the quota is met. So this makes things difficult for people like Cam because he has to essentially compete with people who are just doing it for fun and looking to cover the cost of their gas by selling a couple fish. And it's significantly more pressure on the fishery. Every day you catch fish, it's recorded, sent to the state, they keep track of it. And once that quota is met, they close down the season. They just actually had a meeting on December 5th at Mass Maritime about quotas and this and that. And they said that the recreational harvest was 2.3 million pounds. And that was just fish, you know, people probably took home. That's what they estimated. Never mind what was killed. Quota was, I believe, 600,000 pounds, something like that. They over tripled our quota. And that's just with recreational. And that's just an estimate as to people taking fish home. The idea that recreational fishermen account for over three times as much striper harvest as commercial fishermen may sound unrealistic, but keep in mind, recreational anglers greatly outnumber commercial anglers. And while commercial fishermen are having to deal with a set quota for a season that lasts about three to four weeks, recreational anglers are allowed one fish of a certain size per day year round. And if you do the math, that can mean a lot of harvested fish. Rich Janishek decided to use his position as a charter mate to let his clients know that you don't need to be keeping that many striper. A lot of people don't realize how much fish they get from that until it's diced up and then they take it home and then people just they, they'll throw it in the freezer and then like forget about it and and I'll be honest like when I was a kid like and we used to go on the same charter boat that I ended up working on like I think that was one thing that kind of scarred me because like we would eat fish like we would we get a limit of stripers go home back to New Jersey and we would eat fish every day for like a week and a half straight until eventually like went to waste, thrown in the trash. Um, as I started to get older, I, I had a job as like a dock attendant back in Jersey. I remember I got a call from the mate that worked on that charter boat. He called me and was like, hey, I need, you know, do you want to fill in? I was like, OK, sure. Like, I would love to come out and, and actually work and make money, you know, fishing, especially as, uh, you know, like an, I was I think I was 18 or 19 years old. And I was, it was right towards the end of high school before I was going to college. I've always been a conservative fisherman. So there was always an aspect of that that I, I didn't really enjoy, I'll be honest, because of the fact of like a lot of people would come out and they want to kill fish to take, to take to eat. But then you also have to look at it and be like, well, people have to eat. It doesn't really make sense for, you know, say people to pay all that kind of money and then just go buy other stuff at a supermarket. I was probably kind of a weird mate, like other than working as a mate, I would also find it my job to like educate people that were coming on these charters because I've, I've seen it happen many times before where customers would come out. I think when I started working for Captain Dave, it might've even been to a man at the time. So they could have even kept up at 12 if they're, if they had, you know, six people on board. So I would just be like, you know, this is how much meat you're going to get from one fish. You know, like we could just release this so it doesn't go to waste because I was like, you know, if you don't eat this within a couple of days, it's going to go bad sitting in the fridge. So you're going to have to either freeze it with like a vacuum sealer and, and then you, you can extend the life of it. And once I started educating people on that, then they would be like, wow, you know, I never thought about that. Like, you know, I think we only need a couple fish then, like a couple stripers, and then maybe we'll get a couple sea bass and a fluke. I tried to do the best I could to try and reduce the amount of pressure uh, especially on the striped bass because I, you know, love striped bass. There's more fishermen and less fish to go around. So I do think the recreational harvest rules need to change to reflect that. Not everybody is going to be able to take home a fish every day with how many people I really get on the water now. On the commercial aspect, I do think we should go down to 10 fish just to try and lengthen out that season as well as you know hopefully get a couple fishermen off the water that might not need to be on the water you know if you don't need 15 fish to get your limit people might not be as motivated to chase that bite sort of say maybe spread out the fleet a little bit you know i want to see my kids be able to do this someday and you know we want to see this fishery last i'll net fish even if it's a keeper but it's close i'm like you know i want to get it in in the boat safe measure it if it's not good it's back in the water in two seconds you know swimming away so take it easy on us because we're doing our best to maintain this fishery as well because we don't want to see it die because we don't want to 
you know, see our livelihood go away. Nobody wants to kill, like, unnecessarily kill the fish and waste it as a resource. Or the best thing you can do is just do your best to release the fish and keep the fish healthy. And if everyone's just doing their best, then that, ha I mean, that's as good as you can really ask for. But again, people got to eat. People have to make a living. If certain people have been doing it for 40, 50, 60 years, you know, like I've been filming for almost 10 years. So like add 20 more years of filming on top of that. And then all of a sudden someone says, hey, like you can't film anymore and, and wants to take my cameras away. And then that's like my my livelihood. That's how I make, you know, make money. It's it's there's a, lot, there's a lot of controversy behind it for sure. I know guys that are just like, if they know you're a commercial striper fisherman, they'd probably never talk to you. Like the really hardcore guys just try and be a little more open like that's been people's livelihoods for hundreds and hundreds of years and it's not as simple as an issue being like oh we just shut down the stripe of commercial fishing like that's a a gigantic industry that employs a lot of people i would say in both sides just try and be a little more open-minded of each side's opinion the youtube algorithm thinks you might like these two videos so feel free to check them out or not AK-47s, Mac-11s, Glocks and 9s and all 